I'm just wondering like, where the control is. Yeah, it's over there. Mm -hmm. oh, we already discussed it. So, great. Uh, where are the papers? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, this is uh, um, a really great, um, and uh, I'm very happy for this uh, possibility that we have here, and uh, that uh, you know that we are uh, taking advantage of that. Uh, we had the SDS forum in Kyoto recently, and there are so many people that uh, you know come there from, uh, from actually from many different parts of the world. But a little special is quite a lot of people from Sweden that come there for and have a tradition to come there. And uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, discuss that also why that is. But I think there are some similarities in the, in, uh, the way that uh, we approach uh, research, how we build up uh, you know, collaborative ways of working. And I think that is uh, something that really appeals to, um, both, to both in Japan and, and also in, um, in Sweden. So I think that is one of the reasons that we connect very well. But uh, uh, besides that, I think it's really happy that also this group that are coming in this in us also includes uh, several from Japan that wanted to come and, and also take this opportunity where we meet you know, across uh, different types of, all different types of scientific perspectives but also that we connect with, uh, with the uh, grant, with the uh, funding of uh, agencies of, uh, of research that are interested and want to understand how we can also support in a better way the interdisciplinarity and also the curiosity drive, the, the global knowledge of forefronts, how we can really support that, which is of course uh, our model here at OIS is really uh, what we would like to find from our perspective, how can we make our model really to be resilient and to withstand the, the changes around us and, and also when we are supposed to grow a little more later on. So we need to really understand so that model is untouchable. And so, uh, so uh, today I want to really, to, uh, to really encourage you all to take advantage of course to use your interest in the science because that's what it's all about of course. But in that, I think it's very important to see what are the things that you can actually uh, learn from these people with other experience about how to, how to connect across uh, uh, transdisciplinary even, and also you know, to understand how, are, how can we build up the trust so that we can really also get uh, more possibilities in our, in our research environment. So we put together um, a, a program, and, and the, the base of the program from the beginning was that we had uh, the, the, we are connecting it a little bit to the Mirai network that we are actually a member of, and I don't know if all of you know that, but that's a, a, a network that has uh, been around for many years, and uh, between Sweden and Japan universities, and, uh, and we now, Kyushu University is uh, actually uh, leading it right now and going into a, what do you call it, 3.0 perspective for that and uh, really lifting it to the next level and, uh, and uh, taking it over from uh, Umeå. Uh, was, it, was it in Umeå? Well, it's, it's in Umeå in Sweden. In Sweden. Oh, sorry. I don't know. I'm not happy. But it was actually the, the conference last time was in, uh, in Umeå. So, so these, uh, the two universities that are heading uh, this organization in, in both countries are here, uh, as well as also the, um, one of the enthusiastic founders uh, stint from Sweden that is here. So let me just, now you're starting to understand, to, to be curious and who is here really. So, um, so of course I want to see a little, say a little bit about, so first we have then I said the, vi the Vice Chancellor of Umeå University, Hans Adolfsson, is sitting here in the front. And, uh, and then we have uh, Professor Tur Turbjörn Lund that you're going to listen to uh, soon. He's, actually a University uh, of Gothenburg and Chalmers University technology. And in the, in the area of mathematics and some other areas, we are actually, we merged uh, the environments in the two universities, one private and one national university. And, and this, this has had a lot of uh, positive effects, I think. 
Yes, yeah, so, um, so, and then we have Lars Hultman here, professor from Linköping University, but also CEO of the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research, which is also a really kind of a different type of a, um, a funding agency that can really go out where nobody else does. Is that right, Lars? Yeah, right. Um, so then we have uh, uh, also um, uh, Katarina Lirikin, you are also here, thank you, welcome. And, uh, you, you come as company with Lars, yes. And uh, Andreas Götenberg is here, and he is uh, the executive director of this of Stint, who's supporting uh, also the Mirai uh, uh, collaboration. And Stint stands for the Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. So, um, so uh, then we have um, uh, Dr. Laura Barbier. Barbieri. Uh, Barbieri. Barbieri. Okay, so she is uh, uh, she's uh, living here in Japan for and working for Stint. Yeah. So you are based in Osaka. Kyoto. Kyoto. I, yes, doing a postdoc in Osaka. Yeah, and I was collaborating with Stint. Okay, yes. So that's a good person, also good to know. So Ulrika Björksten, uh, and Secretary General for Public and Science Sweden, is uh, uh, really an interesting also person that you will have a chance to, to discuss uh, very interesting things with. So, and uh, we, also ha uh, we also have then uh, Kash uh, Kasuhiro uh, Shiusaki. There you are, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, president of, uh, of NICE and also representing the Japan uh, Association of National Universities. Yes, thank you. And then we have Hirokyo uh, Kaneko. There you are, okay. And uh, is vi vice president of uh, uh, overseeing strategic research programs in JST. So very welcome to you too. And then we have Professor uh, Kenji Iwata, and uh, 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 executive vice president for international affairs in Kyushu University. And you have with you also, uh, where, is, where is your, he's not here? Uh, uh, Shunsuke Sadoshima? Yes, he's uh, <laughs> Oh, he's coming, okay. So also from Kyushu University. And uh, finally, um, uh, Ishii Imura. Yeah, very welcome to you. Executive Vice President for, for um, uh, Institute Strategy. And at, um, yeah, now you have a new name of your Tokyo Tech, it's called Science Tokyo. Yeah. So, really nice, welcome to you too. And so, uh, with that, I, I just want to uh, to really give the word over here a little bit for before we start um, to Andreas, uh, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Karin, and uh, it's nice to see all of you here today. Uh, so I'm Andreas Gothenberg and I'm heading Stint, the Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. Uh, just uh, to mention that previous to that I was working in Japan as a science technology attaché at the Embassy of Sweden. So I got to know about OIST at the quite early stage, I think around 2004 or so. And I've been kind of following OIST over the years. and. Uh, I was very happy to come here uh, in April and met with uh, Karin, and at that time we decided that we should bring some Swedish university representatives here. And that's why I'm very delighted to be here with this group of, of colleagues and hope that we can uh, further some uh, more collaboration between Sweden and OIST. But also on that note and to follow up on cooperation between um, Swedish and Japanese universities, we have the Mirai project that was initiated actually 2016. We have a program at Stint called Strategic Grants, which is a, a program for university presidents to create strategic cooperation uh, on university level, but giving the opportunities for researchers with bottom-up projects to carry out that within this strategic umbrella that universities, university presidents have created. So currently in Mirai we have 10 Swedish universities and 
seven Japanese universities participating. And the different areas that Mirai is doing research in is material science, aging society, sustainability. And then the idea is that innovation should be, be kind of cross-cutting all these uh, areas. And uh, this summer, the Stint Board of Directors decided to grant an application from Mirai to continue uh, for 3.0, which is actually year seven to nine, because it was going on already for six years. And uh, Stint normally uh, funds new novel projects. However, the board decided to grant uh, funds to, to, Stint, uh, to Mirai 3.0 because it was taking an approach working more with uh, industry and entrepreneurship in Sweden and Japan, which we thought was very interesting. So I think if you're interested in collaborating with Mirai, then I understand from Karin that you should contact the grants office here at OIST. And with that said, uh, I hope you will find uh, these days today and half a day tomorrow interesting and uh, we will see more collaboration between Swedish universities and OIST. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, before I go on, I think you please, uh, uh, you know, take the opportunity to talk to these uh, guests that we have here today when you, when, and they will be here today and tomorrow. And tomorrow you will also be able to listen to Lars uh, giving a, a lecture on uh, um, two-dimensional gold. What about that? And we're to get, working together with Japanese researchers as well. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. So, but uh, we also have something uh, really interesting here today, uh, right now, and uh, you know, this is to really to to bring the energy up really high, and in, in the kind of looking across uh, different uh, possibilities in, in science. And so, I cannot think about anybody better to do that than uh, than Tobia Lund, who is um, uh, yeah, you you. It's hard to really define which area of science you are in, but you're a mathematician, yes. And you, then you're a very curious mathematician, and you don't miss any opportunity to, to connect to anything interesting. And so I think that is actually, uh, you, you kind of live the, this spirit that we have here. And, uh, and that, I think, as, you, as I said, you're connected to two universities, but you're also connected to really interesting uh, development for graduates or for students, like in the Unitech, for example. And, and so you are actually also helping the next generation to really be curious beyond uh, you know, imagination. I know because I go to that also. So I know what you're, what you're talking about. But, but now you're gonna, he's going to really bring us into um, uh, you know, the mood here of um, what I hope uh, we will have a panel uh, uh, discussion after that will take advantage of this uh, higher temperature that Tobin will give you. So well, please take over. Thank you very much. Yes. This is such a great honor and I, I'm so happy to, to be able to, to meet you here, to come here and I'm so, so glad to see that um, the weather is, as, as I was heard, not warm, but cold. <laughs> That's interesting. I hope that, uh, let's see if we can, if that's kicking off here. What do you think? Uh, is it uh, connecting to the, the, yeah, great. So it should be black because I'm going to move over to representation later. So at the STS forum, we, as I had the privilege to sit next to you when there was a, an, an, a gentleman from England and said that, oh, the blackboard is terrible. You know, we, we shouldn't just uh, copy the notes from lecture and going back without passing anyone's brain. But I thought, oh, blackboards are not bad. So I was really happy to hear that you had blackboards in this room. And of course, I'm even more happy because you have the famous Japanese shorts here, which is a, it's a pleasure to write with and make drawings. So I thought we're going to make some drawings first. And, Thank you, Corin, for these very nice words. And thank you for being a forerunner to everything I'm trying to do here. And Corin used to be the president of the Unitech International that was mentioned here, how to help young um, students to become the future leaders in technology. And um, 
we have uh, discussing things that we are going to touch upon here. And the main thing I would like to talk about, or that we, it's probably the grand theme here that we, was already mentioned by President Marquides, is how can we support both basic science and applied science at the same time to make that valuable so we can have both deepening knowledge but also new companies that we also heard uh, was mentioned before here in, in, um, in, um, in the entrepreneurship way. How can we make that at the same time? Is that possible? And um, in order to talk about that, I think uh, I would like to give some examples from my own grassroots, very small science things, but also to, to, to exemplify from uh, my two years as a deputy vice chancellor at the University of Gothenburg, who in, previously was in charge of the Mirai. So, so we were very much involved there, and I hope uh, that uh, that would prosper now with the strong support from, uh, from Andreas and uh, etc. here. So um, the thing that I was um, is in charge of at that time was to, uh, does it have to be reminded to be black, you think? <laughs> is it okay? <laughs> the thing I was um, uh, responsible for, I was a vice, deputy vice chancellor in collaboration and utilization. Some that cannot connect to you in Swedish. And uh, to make that uh, work in the, in the different faculty, university, it took some extra time here and, and effort. So a tool that I found was really useful was the, the new so-called uh, knowledge square, which is a you know embarrassing simple <laughs> or development. You all know about the knowledge triangle, maybe, that we have, we have research, we have education, and then we have the rest, you know, the third task or the, you know, the thing that didn't fit really. The third, <laughs> yeah, and, and that is, that's been a bit problematic because nobody feels at home here with, because it, it relates to everything. So what happened at the European uh, Commission here, they, they said, okay, now we're going to do a knowledge square instead. Now that's a geometrical development that's mind boggling. <laughs> You have research, you have education, and on top of that, you have also innovation and service to society. All oh, these shorts are so good. <laughs> <laughs> the service to society and innovation. So by splitting it into two parts, we got the humanities feeling very much at home. Social science here, you know, finance and business people. And, and that was uh, so much help for me to kind of join forces I talk about actually to, to be able to be here. But it was a lot of resistance because everybody knows that this is what counts here, right? And then maybe, of course, you have to you take care of your students. That's a, that's a matter of being decent professor. But these parts, you know. So I think that if you view this, what we, we can have the axis here being, uh, what do we say, what is prestige? prestige here, then it looks probably like this here. You have research, you have education, and then something else. That in um, worst case is that the demerit is that. Um, so, so that is how, how probably things are in reality. And it's also a reason why we are very much uh, easier to measure these things when it comes to if you want to do an evaluation of someone to actually do the, the bibliometric trick, right? So that's so much easier than to, to measure what's going on here. I mean, to, just to look at the education, how do we do that? That's, that's a big debate. And these things, we haven't started it. We don't really, we can of understand what it is now, start to get a unified conception of that, but to start to measure that, it takes more time if you want to do it. And it's not only a thing that we want to do, it's by law, at least in, in Sweden, that you have to, it's written in the law that you have to address all these four corners. So, so I, I uh, was surprised how well this took off and we have been traveling around, me and Juan Blaus, with uh, uh, talking about this knowledge square, Juan Blaus from the Royal School of Technology in Stockholm. And we, uh, then I also thought about a uh, Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. Let's suppose that um, Bologna never happened. Universities were not here. 
So we were in a parallel universe where people went to high school and then they just took a job and worked with development. So research was an unknown word and you are given the task of someone, I, I think we should introduce universities and your job is to pitch that. How would you do that? Okay, what I would do is I'd say, okay, I have a new way here. We have a new way to do service to society. And to do that, we are building upon that we are making the, we're making here the, the education a, a bit more, um, so I'll do it the right way here. We're making the education in a way that it's longer. We're going beyond high school because there are more to, to, to teach here. And also, we will also have a big house that makes innovation for the general good that can come out here. Uh, that sounds good, but we also need a, a base resource to support these two things, and that we call that research. So that is how the pitch would be if we didn't have the universe in the first place, I think. So I think it might be good to think about it like that, so that there's no given way that this the research is the only thing that we should strive for. So uh, if, if I just do the thing here again, I'll say that what uh, I think in the, the university leaders are really should uh, aim for to, to make universities a leading university for the future is to be able to make the, these interactions, if I take another color here, might be good. If you, if you see that you make an interaction, say that, okay, the research can give you a new innovation. So, so to promote that, we already do that, of course. That's what's happening in the entrepreneurship <coughs> part. But we also try to include the research as much as we can in our teaching to make it relevant. And sometimes it goes out the way around that they, you know, a, a student can ask a really good question. It can generate a, a research question. And you can do it, of course, like that. And you, then you have the internal or maybe basic research that you do a research and repeat itself. Or maybe you have another question that goes not to the same starting point, but to another de department that the interdisciplinary research, but you have this internal functionality as well. And um, if you're happy, you push down your innovation here and it goes here, and the society says, oh yeah, th this looks fine, but it's not really what we wanted. So then it probably go back to the drawing table here, and you can repeat that a couple of times. Another way to do it is to, to actually go to the society and see what do you really want. So that is called the need-based thing, that you go, okay, this is what they want. So go directly here, and then probably it's, it's only one cycle that you have to take. So I think that being able to make this, all these interactions with, is going to be one of the important things for the future universities. So that, that is one diagram I would like to, to draw here. And um, when we talk also about the internal thing here, how much should we put in this, you know, doing basic research, or curiosity driven, as it's called a fundamental, versus the applied here. How, how to balance that, or why do we want to do that? So a uh, famous diagram was then uh, drawn because you have this, if you say you have a basic sign here and you have applied here, but I can't, maybe I'll do it the, the other way around so it will be the same as in the, in the literature here. Uh, so, so, so it was criticized by Stoke, Don Stoke, who said that this is not one dimensional problem. You can actually be both here. So why don't we try to split this up and say that, okay, this is a two-dimensional vector diagram. So you have the, this basic line here, and you've applied here. Then you have these four different sections. And you say that if you do both here, you are on the quadrant that Pasteur was working on. So he wrote a book called Pasteur's Quadrant that you are doing both at the same time. So you apply, but you also come up with new basic tools here. In this part here, he put Edison. Edison really focused on doing the applied thing to get the thing working, to get the bulb working. I mean, he was really smooth, so he, he sold his idea before it worked. You know, fake it until you make it. And you know that the... Uh, Elizabeth Holmes used that as well, and she, she didn't make it, but she faked it. And her first prototype called Edison. This has been interesting. 
And we have bore on this side, when, oh sorry, this up here in the bore, when uh, very basic, it didn't look for applications at all here. So that's a picture that was introduced in that book. Uh, so I thought maybe there is uh, other ways to slice or carve this, to, pr to borrow this, uh, this uh, uh, notation from Plato that we can try to carve up the cloud of science in different ways. So, so in order to try to make researchers work together and be able to th lower thresholds for friction in between different groups, uh, I and, and a colleague, we wrote a book together about modeling because we were trying to, to work on things interdisciplinary and see that, oh, they, but there's so many different ways you can look at models. And then we try, oh, let's, let's find a book that we can teach our students about general modeling, and we couldn't find one because they're modeling in geophysics or, you know, or in organic chemistry, but not modeling modeling. So we, we wrote a little book like that just for, for that need and to, to also get into the culture and had, for example, the same question asked to, to 10 different scientists. And uh, in that book, there was a diagram that I thought was, might be also be useful here. Um, yeah, I know it by heart before I don't have to see the book. So, so we, we said that if you have a model, you can plot it in this two-dimensional diagram where you have this prediction prediction force on this one. How good is your model to predict something? And the other one, how good is your model to explain? Uh, that is uh, a different thing, right? So in the same thing that you can split this into two dimensions, the basic and the applied. We say that, okay, your model might be here. It's not so good in prediction and not so good to explain, but you can improve it. And then you have a choice. Can you make it more understandable by, by having a more logical way to present it, then you move this way. And this is usually the mathematical way. Or if you want to make more, I'm just there for the, you know, for the predictions, predictions with a C here. Predictions, I go this way. Or maybe you take something in between. So you, it gets better and better, and at some point you add more and more parameters and it's getting a more and more black box and eventually you come over here. That's a usual projection that you have. Or maybe what I tell students, maybe you want to have a, a model here that you can talk about and explain and, and then you have something that you can really work with if you want to make predictions. You have to have two different ways in this two dimensional. So if you add this here to this scientific cloud that you have a basic dimension here, basic or fundamental research, you have this applied, and then you go on and add this uh, explanation force, and then you can have this new dimensional prediction power. You, you will end up with a high dimensional cloud here that you can slice it, and is, is that, would that be any help? Maybe it would, so I, I, I thought of, of about trying to do that in a way that, that we would, mm. Uh, uh, see that you can slice this in, in many different ways. And maybe you can also illustrate that in a kind of spider web diagram. So if I try to do, do that here, we probably, I, I must need to know that uh, since we're out a bit of the timing here, what, what is the time frame? When should I stop now? I don't know who I should look at. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 10 after. 10 after. 10 after. Okay, okay. So I should speed up there. So because the plan was also give some examples to introduce the, the panel here and try to pick something that would, would be suitable. But maybe I will do it that very quickly because I thought of, well, let's start with this kind of thing here that we, we start with this basic here, basic science, and we have applied on this way. They are not linear, but to, to fit with everything, we need to make them a bit linear here. And then we have explanation explainable, or how, how good is your model or, or your work here to explain something new, and how good is it to predict. And then try to fit in other ways to, to look here. Uh, for example, today there is a very, very popular models that have a lot of parameters. So the number of parameters could be one. And then we can have also how doable something is. 
because you don't want to get into a risky business. You, you want to know that, is that product doable or not? Number of parameters, what, what do you, what I say when I talk about models that are very famous now, even get Nobel Prizes, where are they in this diagram? Yeah, exactly, so they are living here, these machine learning models. You don't get wise, you get really good predictions, but it's, it's really hard to understand what's going on. And uh, so high number of parameters, that's something that you can have for high precision, but it's, it's not really helping with that part. And if you, if you look at number of parameters there and the application, if it's doable, we can start also to think about if you here, uh, a uh, favorite of mine here, if, if it's problem, problem based. Does this come from an external problem? Is there, is there actually a need for this in, in the hospital? Does someone ask for it? Or is it, on the other hand, tool, tools driven? That you have, you, you know your set of equations, I love them, so I just go around and try to find problems that fit with them. That's a very usual way to do research. So, th so this is a bit, it's not linear, but uh, I just put them on a different side here and try to make fit here with things that are in between here. So, so then also a thing that was mentioned, curiosity, which I like, but it's also a bit dangerous because curiosity says that, why do you do this? Because I'm curious. That means end of discussion. That's my personal opinion, right? But so you can be curious in many ways. You can be curious to say that I really want to understand the deep meaning of, of gravity, or I'm curious if you can really get away with this. You know, there are many ways you can be curious about. So I think um, curious is about something, a personal drive that you have, that, uh, that is very important, but it can also be hiding something here. And on the other side here, I would like to say that uh, talk about who asked the question of what you're working on right now. If it's yourself, it's your own curiosity. If it is something you wrote in your previous paper, or, or the say, for future research, that's still yourself, right? So then you're here. And if you move up there, someone else, so this would be interesting. Then you get from someone else, if that was published, et cetera, until you come up to the point here where it's an old, unsolved, famous problem up here, right? So there's a whole thing that, uh, so you can say that well known, how well known is the problem? And that is, of course, really hard. If, because if it's well known, a lot of people have already tried it, and therefore uh, we can have a, an axis here for how hard the problem is, which is very, I think, useful in, if I think about my own background in, in pure mathematics and that we didn't care about the applications, then this was important. It should be hard. The thesis should be really hard because otherwise you, you have to prove your technicality and skills here. And after that, it's curiosity in the sense that you should show good taste in picking the right problem. And that's the testing of that. But that comes second hand because the hardness in your thesis is decided over a problem that your advisor gave you. But then when you're independent, you have to pick a good problem. And if you can do something that is well known, you sold something, then you have a steady job for the rest of your life. So, so it's kind of, you know, we are working on these, or I used to before I switch into more applied stuff. And one thing that is very, very hard, impossible to foresee is, is this, if it's, a, if it's surprising. Is the, the, if you find this, oh, did, what happened here? Why did you do that? And so usually that happens under serendipity, serendipity, that you find someone, you, by accident, you walk and meet someone, and you have these meetings where you talk about something else, and you come up with this new idea that was completely out of thin air. And uh, as Carmen did discuss that, you said when you interviewed all the Nobel Prize winners that you met here, that they are always almost pointing out in this part. So we would like to support this as a university. We would also like to, to make the curiosity in the sense that people can, can think about this and, and be projected into meeting without having to be too focused. But on the other hand, we would also like us to take part in the other corners by having this problem drive that you are, you are driving with a problem that is somebody wants to solve. So last semester I was in um, uh, at Stanford at biodesign where everything was about this needs finding. So they spent more than half of their time finding the right need before they tried to solve something. 
So in the engineering part, we are so quick to come to solutions. And I think that we can learn from, from that by uh, trying to really ask the right question in that sense. So I think we are moving away a bit from, from that uh, corner here. So I uh, hope I can see if we can make it into a better picture here. Then. So this is the, what I call then the science, science watch here that you can maybe place your project or your research uh, proposition. And I also have different colors. So these colors are then representing if something blue is what happens afterward, after you don't know if it's hard or not. I mean, that's a scariness for, for being an advisor. You can give a problem that is too hard, that's impossible to solve, or it's too easy, it's even worse, it's trivial scary thought and then there is always something in between there and the green part is what you can think about before you start here. So, so you can take your favorite project and, and do a, a similar thing with that. Oh here we go. Yeah. And uh, so, so for example if you look here and say oh this is not so basic on this line. So it, I mean it's, it's of course just relative everything here. It's very much tool-based. It's curiosity, yeah. And so you, you get a kind of a shaded structure if you do that. To, and I try to, for fun to do that with the bore here. I would say the thing you get printed here is a, a bit different because I, I was a strong development uh, at 4 o'clock this morning when I changed this to between this, this order here. <laughs> I also have to thank uh, Cecilia because I thought of saying, oh, it's important to take, talk about the problems, problem-based. But then, what, what do you mean? I, she started to, to, Cecilia, where are you? You're here, right? Yeah, thank you. So that communication I really like. So it's, it's all due to you. So this was created more or less on the airplane here. So Bohr, I think, would, I mean, it's, he, he is all about the explaining something, right? And it's very surprising, super hard and his basic research. And of course it was driven a little bit by curiosity, but it was mainly about these questions that were flowing around at that time. So it's, and a well-known, that's hard to say, it's well-known in this little field, but maybe not in, in general. Yeah. Pasteur, so in that book here, he can do both. But I think what Pasteur, he got really two questions from two fields. One was from an industry. Oh, we have some mold here, can you do something about it? And it, I think he approached that in the same scientific manner as the, when he got from, from a, another open question. So he's a brilliant researcher just approaching it similarly, having it's the same kind of, of neatness and scientific mind even when it's applied to things. So I think you can see that as being two different shadows put on top of each other because he did that in two different, like this one, this is super applied then. Edison, he didn't care about the experiment, he just wanted make what he promised all the shareholders that he had already had. So, so it's very need-based, and it's well known to make light here. And of course, extremely hard. And so if you compare them, you maybe see that, okay, if you add Bohr and Edison, you get Pasteur, that helps, maybe something like that. And uh, so then I will, yeah, I need to be very super quick here, so I shouldn't. I have to make a choice. What to, I was going to talk about a, a really old problem by Hippocrates that he, he mentioned that why do circular wounds not heal? So that was my entry point at that point. It's, it, I thought it was really nice, especially since much later I thought he put it up to say that it's, it's for the, the, the doctor to know the fact, but it's for the geometrician to know the reason for the fact, actually to explain why. I think that is a question that has now been a bit forgotten during these last three years. Instead of making a forecast, also ask ourselves why something is like it is. And uh, this is an extremely old problem, and I, I have some ideas there by serendipity. I met people at the hospital in Gothenburg, and I said, oh, I have an idea. Uh, suppose that you have a, a circular wound. Why would you have that? But because uh, Hippocrates said they don't heal. Well, we don't have circular wounds, she said. We, we, we knit them together. No, but, but just for the case of making a model, our models don't work. So we have this kind of decision when I saw that there is different cultures we need to overcome to make this happen. 
So I, I was then taught to say, oh, but you know, if you, if you have a model, you can try to see if, if growth hormone beta is working or not. No, growth hormone does not work. I have to go to my patient, bye bye. So that was a really tough uh, talk for me and I talked to the Nestor in, and um, I guess you, some of you know him well uh, in the mathematical biology and oh, how, is, how are things in Gothenburg? It's fine, but I can't go get hold of the doctors. They're not interested. Don't tell me you went to the hospital. Yes, you should never go to hospital. You have to wait until they come to you, he said. <laughs> so then I started to wait. <laughs> and, uh, but, but before that, the, that idea that I had was uh, very much curiosity driven and was tool based on certain amount. And I don't have any time to talk about that. But if <coughs> somebody's interested in see my little uh, uh, it's circular wound, it's, it says number or parameter, it's, it's zero. I don't have a one single parameter and it doesn't explain anything, but it's kind of, it gives you a flavor of what, what, why the circle is really bad. So I waited and uh, during the waiting time I, I talked about something about um, population dynamics, since there will be a population dynamic expert in the, the panel here, so I thought maybe mention that here. So talk about, uh, ton, we have this a lot of tons, or well, not tons, but we have kilos of bacteria in the gut where they communicate. And, and there, so this is a famous experiment from, from Bush here, etc., from the 80s, when they put a chemostat with one single strain of E. coli. And they, they put in nutrients and took away waste. And after two weeks, there were four different strains. So that shouldn't happen in a uniform environment when only one should be the strong survivor. So what happened here? So the reason was there was a cross feeding. They were eating, I guess maybe I should say, they were eating partially the, the, the internal um, uh, goods here and they were leaving waste and that waste got you know, more and more accumulated so that gave a new niche for a new species to be optimized for and et cetera, et cetera. So that, that kind of food web. And we tried to solve that or solve, but looking at that in, in make a new model uh, in an artificial ecology way where we have this R as nutrients. We looked at the energy difference and we saw that if your energy difference is high enough, you, with some probability you get an offspring, a new agent here, and you can, with some probability, also have um, a mutation in the system. And this food pieces get more and more eaten and lower and lower energy in that sense. And we try to put together tools by using famous, uh, like Chan, Chan on the entropy, to say that, so, okay, so, so Schrodinger said that uh, life is something that sucks order from its environment. So using that to, to use energy as an entropy. And von Norman also talked about entropy and it had this automata as, as the food pieces and we, I just had a Viking picture for yours. <laughs> so we call it Urdar for the, the, the well where the Vikings were. And uh, you see here, we have here all the cell automata on this side, and we then let the species compete. And we saw one species was really good at this one, and then there's another one. So it never stops, and you can have this food web, so you can look at food ecosystem, and we can look at these relations in between them. And especially, this, this is a bit of a famous question. If you have a system and you add more energy, will there be fewer or more, more species? Was it, and that's something that is, of course, or, the, or that you study here a lot, the ecology and the speciation, how many species can we have in the system? How do we make that happen? And in this special setup, it means that the lower flow rate, the lower of the incoming energy, the the more of different species, because then you have more of leftovers. In high flow, it just flush us out and you have the high energy and there is more or less one species that eat that more efficiently. Yeah, okay, so I need to stop here. But I, um, you yeah. know, uh, to, to, I can just make a very short say to say that I, we, we can do that also in, in a proper way, making replicator dynamics and do that as a study of this simulation. So we, do, we use the experiment to, to look at, we have coexistence of three different species at the same time. So that created another shape. And now I got a phone call from the doctor. So he said, oh, I have a, I don't, you don't know me, but I heard that you're doing mathematical biology. So I have a problem with a bypass, can you help me? Yeah, and that became, an, an, 
a little study of a bypass but fluid optimization and that became a company eventually where we studied that for optimal things and he also oh, then he came with another question oh i have uh, another thing with this with the stents what you have after you know the balloon expansion but i would like to take them out can you come up with a way to take out the stent so then i did that as, as well uh, that was a completely different way of solving that was a straightforward engineering part and that was a, a just by serendipity i would say that just try to find new ways to do that and we solved that by using nitinol we have a material scientist here nitinol the memory alloy and the third one was oh, i should just uh, don't look we don't look at this paper <laughs> and the third one was um, this is or maybe i can show you that the resulting the stand, this is an ordinary stamp on this side and and this is a sheep and that one is the removal one that that uh, it's taken out there in real time you can see that anyway um the so, so all of these can have different features a very old problem here is compression treatment and this is from carvings in the in a cave and the one th think that you know in precision medicine that we are right now that we should be able to have control over the, the, the bandaging. But it turns out that this is the current state of the art. This is a German nurse that has measured over thousands of, of bandaging process with a pressure sensor. And the, the, their task was to give a pressure between 50 and 60 minutes of mercury. You see, it's not so many, it's 10% that reaches that target. But the, the worst thing is that the, the, the big variation, total variation is up to 145 there or something which is if it's above 80, it's dangerous. You can lose your leg. And that happens many, for many legs every year. So by using, first solving the wrong problem to have the, you know, the tension, but actually using the Laplace Loa, I've killed my darlings here. But this is a resulting way of, of doing just the, the, the textile thing. And at that point, I remember when I was asked this question, oh, it's fun, we can add this sensors. That was an engineering part in me that we can have Bluetooth and we can all do all this stuff. But uh, the mathematical part was more, how, can, how easy can you make that? By, by clean just the, the textile itself. So I went to this textile school and eventually solving the wrong problem by solving it for constant tension instead of pressure, we came up with this solution. So that works really well now. And we have soft tissue engineering here as well, I, I was told. So the next problem is to understand what happens inside the leg if you have a given pressure distribution on it. So that's what's on, going on right at the moment. So compression was the, the whole thing here. It was kind of uh, a lot of surprising elements, but the prediction was an important part in that sense here. So that's a different shape. So I just want to end with, you can have your own stuff here, and it looks, I don't know if that's helpful, but I think Going back to what you said in the beginning here, where that, how can we support as, in the, as a leadership here, basically applied science at the same time. Maybe that, the, I'm sorry, Professor Marquis, that probably is even harder now because we are making it more complicated. But instead of having just one thing, we have to maybe support all the four corners here in the knowledge square. And maybe at, at, maybe also consider different ways to slice science not only the, the basic side, but there are other ways that you can approach science at the same time, which is more complex, but maybe also hopefully a bit helpful. And I would also like to add after the discussion we had yesterday evening that at the same time in Carl Slow walks on the beach, wide open for serendipities, that maybe you can see something new when you at least expect that. So th thank you very much, and I end with this little, oh, I didn't have that in this. The path even. This is, is this is from six o'clock this morning. <laughs> so by that I thank you. I maybe I should show it. Sorry. By that I thank you very much for for that and sorry for the overdraft here. And I the plan was to to give a, a better uh, introduction to, to the panelists here, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. If there is some, uh, some pressing question, please, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so it was very uh, insightful talk. Um, yeah, so I, I, you, you ended with like how we split science. 
Um, so I'm also interested to know, like you mentioned cellular automata, this is what I wrote here. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a very nice uh, piece of work. It's, um, so I, I wonder like, so for instance, you talk a lot about biology and like I have the feeling like a lot of people, you know, we are experiencing time in which different fields are invading each other. A lot of physicists, mm -hmm. a lot of mathematicians, they go into biological fields. Yeah. And you know, like because of history, like biologists are not like completely ready to sort of take turn and so on. So how do you have an insight on how, you know, we can sort of merge fields and sort of uh, without people fearing to be invaded or like, you know, technology and now AI and all these kind of things, mm -hmm. kind of invading things. So it's good to have category and splitting uh, science in fields, but it's, we're experiencing also a lot of, you know, yeah. Uh, contamination, like in a good sense. Yeah, yeah. People sort of like the Nobel Prize, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, and, and I, I notice like sometimes I talk to people and I don't know much about a lot of fields, but they say, oh, I, I hear something about this and might have something to do on what you're doing. And people tend to be a bit reluctant on mm. sort of opening up. So mm. how do we do this? Yeah, th that's a super good question. So it's part of the trust thing that, uh, that um, <coughs> President Makides, I have to, Stop saying Karin because it's not proper. Maybe. We say that. We say Karin. Karin. Okay, Karin. <laughs> you mentioned the trust, how to build that trust. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that uh, as um, in, in my short leading position, I was really trying to, we have to work together because then the cake gets bigger. So we don't have to fight for splitting the small cake that we feel where it's. But it's, it's really hard to, to put forward that message. We have, but we have to constantly to work on and sh showing good examples on doing that. So when it comes to the field thing here, different fields, so I'm, I, I think, I mean, if you take, for example, now the, the strong development of AI taking over more and more, but if you, if you think about the future, I, I had a discussion with Andrew Eng at Stanford about that, and he said the future problem, the future of AI is that the lack of data. So the low-hanging fruits are taken now. We have skin cancer, but that's because the skin is easy to take photos of it. We have hard-working people in the global south doing this, you know, the finding out the data that is annotated for, for feeding this hungry algorithm of getting more hungry and hungry. So how, so how to come around with There are two ways to do that. Either you can start with something that you know. If you're looking for hands, you shouldn't start with a white sheet. Say, oh, I'm looking for something with five digits. Describe that. And if you start by doing that, you're back in modeling. And if you are, in, or the other way is to, and modeling is part of, of the, the, the old basic knowledge that we have been teaching for a long time. And the other way is to, to generate more image data by generating more annotated data artificially. And that you also need a lot of classical knowledge to do. So I think it will be a renaissance of classical knowledge. So it's good to have different disciplines because then you, are, you have a situation where you can use very technical <coughs> words, you can talk to each other uh, efficiently and you can learn things. But then I think the key is to, to help by supporting the interactions by focusing on a single problem. This is a challenge. We should put a guy on the moon or we should cure that thing. And then forget about all the limitations. You just sit there in the room and you, you're just persons trying to solve that. You have different background that you use, but you will not think about it. I think that would be, a, that's a natural way to, to, to do the interdisciplinary instead of forcing that to happen. Just let's solve this problem. And I know this guy, he can help us with that. You know, so it, I think if that is something that we can support in a better way, then I think we get much further there. I, I, I think I like that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Torben, for a very inspiring lecture. And, and uh, I really love that you used the, the, the blackboard. Uh, oh. that, that was uh, super nice, I must say. Uh, one question and one comment, and I will start with a comment. And I think going into the square that you started working on there and to inter interconnect all the corners, I think you missed one which is very obvious education to, to service for society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is so obvious because that's what we do with education. You, mm. you educate people, you provide them with skills, and they, they will provide service to society. So, I mean, that's sort of, it comes natural. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, uh, really what we do. And the question is, how would your modeling of this, this science watch fit into creating the science watch? <laughs> so, I think that was a... Um, uh, we have to ask Cecilia here. <laughs> so, uh, 
So you start with, I was going to talk about, we have to focus more on the need-based research and, and evaluate that as well. And then um, I've got really good, some good uh, thought-provoking question and starting more and more, but let's, let's try to split that into a part that is more. So it was, I think it was very need-based, how to, to order my own thoughts. And uh, also the, the movies on the airplane was a bit of lagging. So I, I got some time to think. <laughs> so that was an opportunity not to miss. Was that serendipity? That was a serendipity. But it's also nice to have, oh, it's a watch, it's 12, it's not 30, right? So <laughs> thank you, Hans. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, again, Torbjörn, and thanks for the questions. And uh, yeah, give him time. Yes, thank you. So I have a, can I say?